Life Audio. There's some young men and women in my family that God has saved them and captured their heart. And in the midst of that wanting, he's he's the, their shepherd and they have found their wanting in him. And they still struggle and all that, but it's like there's a, there was a big discontentment in this age as they drink of all the things the world has and it just doesn't do it for them at the end of the day. And Jesus does. Yeah. Welcome to Conversations on the Walk. In today's conversation, we will delve into the journey of Shane and Shane, exploring their musical evolution, their vision for the worship initiative, and the profound impact they continue to have on worship music. Here we go. The first question we asked was, as guides and mentors to emerging worship artists and writers, what aspects fill you with hope about this next generation of believers? Man, I mean, you know, having a have a young young a young family, and I have a sixteen year old daughter, um, and get to hang with with a bunch of young people, you know, and having young girls and ladies over at my house, it's just like there is a, I think part of a positive of what's going on in our in our culture right now is there is an empathy for people. And I think there's a genuine like heart care for people who struggle, you know, and they might struggle with, you know, some of the hot topics right now or struggle with things that aren't necessarily hot topics right now, you know, and I think the scripture is clear that it's just like, there's no sin that is common to man. You know, I mean, there is, there, I mean, sin is sin, you know, but I think in the younger generation, I think there is a lot of negatives to it, but I think there's a lot of positives to it as well, where there is a there's a genuine care for people who think differently than us, that is probably different than the generation, even the generation before us, where it was just like kind of an us versus them kind of thing. And so I think there is, the, the downline of the us versus them is still in like our generation. I think we still like, there is just like some muscle memory to like, bad people bad, good people good, kind of like, kind of mentality. Bad denomination, bad good people. denomination. There's bad people and there's yeah. good people. But I think like in, in like having having the age kids that I have, I think it's it's been interesting to see, oh, I think there is something in the heart of the Lord that is close to that, where it's just like there's a genuine care for people who might think differently than us. And I think there is a, I would say in this younger generation, there's a heart of compassion that I think is really in line with the heart of the Father. I think there is, uh, because of technology, maybe the advance of, of technology that we've kind of watched the last couple decades, I'm seeing a, a dissatisfaction happen sooner. So you have access to so many things that the world has to offer via devices. Um, you learn faster that none of that stuff works. Um, so I feel like in the younger generation, um, and a lot of that's just real sad. I mean, I see like, and in, in, you know, I have I have four daughters too. They're all twelve and under, so that um, we're dealing with that stage. Um, but in my lots of my nephews and things, they've experienced things that uh, a decade earlier or sometimes you know 15 years earlier than we would have so there's a drinking of the world and coming to find out man that doesn't work at deep down like i'm not satisfied i'm not sad i'm bored i'm anxious i'm depressed and that's the bad stuff the good stuff is like well what does work what does fill my heart in a way that i'm satisfied and and I, there's some young men and women in my family that God has saved them and captured their heart. And in the midst of that wanting, he's he's the, their shepherd and they have found their wanting in him and they still struggle and all that. But it's like there's a, there was a big discontentment in this age as they drink of all the things the world has and it just doesn't do it for them at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And Jesus does. Yeah. Our culture doesn't see the church as very relevant. So we asked Shane and Shane, how do you answer those who say that they don't need a church community? I, I mean, I think I would say in a relationship, 
I think we see, like Shane was saying, I think in relationship we will seek discontentment in a lot of ways. Um, and I think we always we will see discontentment until we find where the true source of joy comes from, you know? And so I think we can kind of uphold the truths of God and say, hey, there is a fountain that doesn't run out, you know? And it's just like, I hope you see it sooner than later. You know, and so I think we we uphold the things and the truths of God as as the highest goal. And it's just like, I don't know how long it will take by the by the power of the Holy Spirit for the eyes to be illuminated in a way that they might see the truth and it would satisfy their heart because they're going to be satisfied with something. You're going to find something to kind of fill the gaps because there's so many gaps, you know? Um, and until you find the shepherd, you're always gonna be left wanting. I, I think the young people, to, to, your, to your church question, there is a tendency to wanna isolate. Like I, we have an isolated, I mean, and, that's, and devices really enable that, right? I can just go away with my little thing and kind of feel like I have community, so why would I need this community over here? And, um, and I think, there needs to be a little bit of a returning to just God's word. Because um, mm -hmm. in these these kinds of young folks that are like, yeah, I mean, I just, I don't need, I, I got, you know, I got podcasts, I got, I got music, I got Hillsong, I got, I mean, I got, I got everything. I, why would I, why would I need to go to church? I mean, and they have bad connotations of church and their parents did this and I get it. But uh, unless we can find common ground with these young folks on the scriptures, like, do you, but do you believe the scriptures are true? If you don't, then we don't really have any common ground to stand on. Um, but if you do, then um, just the reality of like, if you are his, you're just like, you're like a, a hand that's been cut off and it's just bleeding. It's just flopping around in the middle of a field alone. You know, it's not connected to, you're not, you're not connected to the body in the way that God um, paints the picture of in the New Testament, as far as New Testament church goes. Um, so you were designed for God to worship God in the context of community. And we have a grid for that, and it's called his precious word. And so it doesn't really matter what you think you need. Like, you don't know. Somebody knows what you need, and that somebody is real important. And uh, we're just called to walk by faith and in, 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 in love the book because it's his very word to us. As mentors of other worship leaders, we're interested in hearing about who mentored Shane and Shane. How did that happen? Is you kind of have a Steve Harden. I mean, wait, there was a guy by the name of Steve Harden that was at a, a, a church when I was growing up. And, you know, Shane and I uh, didn't grow up in the church. We didn't grow up really in any kind of believing families. I mean, he was on the West Coast, so he was kind of a little bit more isolated. But I grew up in the South, and so you kind of grew up in the church. Though. Yeah, I kind of grew up in the church. In the in the in the like, I was on the peripheral of the church, where I would dive in and out of the church. Like uh, culturally, it was a part of our kind of world, and so uh, you know, my worldview from you know even my parents were. We would go to church occasionally because my grandfather was a deacon. And so we kind of popped in and out. So I went to church camp every year. I got saved every year. I got baptized every year for 20 years. But I never I never had a saving knowledge of who Christ really was. There wasn't ever really a regenerative work in my heart until my senior year in college. But there was a man who always showed up. There was a man who was faithful to pursue me from an early age. And so whether it was in a locker room on Friday morning, every Friday morning, all through all through high school. And I went because he brought donuts and he's a nice guy. But I mean, the guy gave me a book called The Pursuit of Holiness probably 20 times by a guy named Jeffrey Bridges, you know, and he gave me that and he would quote that all the time. And he was consistent and he's still consistent in my life today. He's the first guy I called when I got saved my senior year in college. And so that I have a guy, that, that I'll say this, you never know the fruit of the seeds that you plant, you know? And so I think the Lord used Steve Harden to plant the seed of faith in my heart. And 
I, he prayed for me. I know he did. I know he did for years. Um, he said he did, and I believe that he did. And I think the seed that he had planted sprouted in a bar in Colleen, Texas in 1997 when my heart was tired enough and the world had dissatisfied me enough that the seed took root and my eyes were open. It's been some miracle when that happens, you know? And so it's like, boom, eyes open. Okay, now what? You know, I didn't know what. And so that morning I wake up, I don't really barely go to bed because it was late on a Saturday night. I walk down the aisle at a Baptist church. Don't even know what the pastor was talking about, but I knew that's what you're supposed to do. You know what I mean? So it's just like, so it's just like I had this cultural like paradigm that, you know, I, okay, I now want to be a Christian. So I need to go up front and I need to, you know, fill out a card and like become a Christian and do the Christian things. But then you do that and the Holy Spirit starts the work, you know, it's just like it begins and the Lord set it up where like, like with community, with people who love Jesus. And we we're all kids. We didn't, we didn't really have any, have any, any got context for like what it looks like to walk out the faith. We just started reading the Bible, singing the Bible. And the Bible started to do the things that the Word of God does, that it 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 cuts, it divides the the, the parts of our body that that are unseen. And it started to do things in the spirit. And so, man, we had no ambition to be anything but really just saying yes. Saying yes. I mean, we had no aspirations to be like worship leaders or musicians or celebrity or any of those things. It was just like somebody called and said, hey, would you come sing some songs at our youth group? And we're like, Sure. Are you sure? Are you sure? I guess. <laughs> sure. You got some lasagna for us? We'll come. You know, and we did that, and that was it. And it was like Shane started writing songs out of the Bible from really just a devotional place. You know, it's just like, man, I gotta, I'm gonna sing this, and this is because I'm begging the Lord to help me believe it. You know, God, I want to believe these things because I don't really believe them, but like just I want to. And like, man, there's something that happens when we inform our heart, when we feed our heart those things that we call things that aren't the way that they should be. And like, and and the Lord does that. And like he implants and he gives wisdom and he, and he, and he measures it out to us in a way when we ask, you know, and, and, and I think in a way that's, I mean, it's called sanctification. There's a word for it. And he sanctifies us and he builds us up and he gives us strength so that, man, when the fire comes, it's just like there's some things we remember. You know, and when we get pressed, the the things of God, like our, the truth of God, the Holy Spirit of God is really helpful. No one really discipled me. Um, I came out of a non-Christian home, a lot of moving and a lot of things happened. Um, I get, I feel like I get discipled a lot now, just yeah. in community, um, just people who are in my life. I'm just like, I'm, I'm, I'm learning, um, even my, like my wife. I'm just like discipling me. <laughs> um, my 12 year old is, is, I'm serious. Like there is a part of, I'm being discipled by my 12 year old in lots of ways. When I was new to the faith and then we accidentally started to sing about Jesus, we were both business majors. No business singing. That's true. Um, no passion for singing. Um, passion for Jesus and, and a yes. Uh, Podcasting wasn't out yet, but like, I remember having like CD series of John Piper and I drove the early shift of our bus, um, like started at a truck, truck stop. I would wake up, Shane did the night shift. I did the early shift. And, um, that dude, that dude was a really big part of my discipleship oh, through the, through my first decade of flopping around and trying to follow Christ. He was very helpful. 
More from Shane and Shane in a moment. But first, we're thrilled to give a shout out to our friends at Planning Center for teaming up with us in today's episode. If you're a musician lending your talents to the church, we've got something really awesome to share with you. It's called Music Stand. Imagine a tool that lets you dive into your digital sheet music seamlessly, sharing notes and direction with your fellow musicians. Well, that's exactly what Music Stand's all about. So this helpful tool lets you personalize your own songbook and easily share it with your musical team. You can also make notes on the fly. With Music Stand, you can highlight draw, type text, and even import notes from others. So it's like having a virtual notebook for your sheet music. During performances, Music Stand allows you to turn pages with a foot pedal. If you're curious to learn more and you're interested in making your rehearsals go a whole lot smoother, head over to planningcenter.com for the full scope. Okay, back with Shane and Shane, we moved into a conversation about songwriting. They are prolific worship songwriters, so we asked, what are you writing about right now? Uh, I'm writing, I'm actually writing more about this this topic because I I feel like it's so, it's what he's doing, it's what he's saying to me. But there's a song called All Sufficient Merit, um, and my wife actually wrote a version of it, and she sent it to me when I was, I was preparing for this record, and she sent me just the the lyrics. And I read them and I was just like, whoa, are you 500 years old secretly? You know, I mean, it is just, it is just so powerful. And it's so, it's easy for me to believe, I say easy, I have an easier time believing that my sins are forgiven, that I've been cleansed by the blood of Jesus, that I'm good forever. I'm saved and safe in him. It's harder for me to believe that he's given me his life. So not only like my sins are forgiven, but the life of Christ has been given to me. So like I'm living out the life of Christ. Like I've been crucified with Christ. I don't even live anymore. But the life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and died and gave himself for me. Um, just this, this great exchange thought of like uh, the, the identity piece of like he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Like that is a hard thing for me to, really believe just it, in, in all of my mess and all of my junk and all of my efforts to, to try to get God to like me so much effort, so much work that doesn't have to go on. If I just believe that the righteousness of God has been given or imputed to me. And now I am living the life of Christ, um, that there is no difference If this were Jesus sitting here and this were me sitting here, there's no difference in righteousness because his righteousness is now my righteousness. And that's a tough thing to believe as a as a guy who has a bunch of sin in him still. That's our identity in him as sons, as as daughters, as kids, that your sins are forgiven and you're and you are now. Perfectly clean. All of Christ's righteousness is yours. All of his merit is your merit. It's not, your merit doesn't get you somewhere or doesn't leave you somewhere. His merit gets you there and you know what I'm saying? And so that's been, uh, that's been just what I've, I've been just digging into that, just trying to go, oh, help me believe that. Even sounds, it even sounds wrong when I say things like that. It's like in my, I feel it in me of like, that sounds wrong. I I can't be, like that can't, that can't work. That math doesn't work. You know, um, and so that's just been something I've been wrestling through. Shane mentioned that the two of them met in business school and their ministry is also a business. So we asked, how do you keep worship sacred? No, I, I think it, it, that's been a process of, of learning. We're not there yet. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I When you said that, I thought of this this book that is on our uh, on a table in our room that we thumb through semi often. It's called Everything Holy. Um. And I think doing what we do has has 
helped teach us that everything in, in, in its different degrees is sacred. Yes, singing is sacred, it's sacred. Um, you know, the word worship, uh, which we were created for, um, worship is obviously sacred. You know, I've, I, I, I'm thinking back to sermons that I've heard on the same word for work is the same word for worship um, in the Old Testament. And obviously kind of the Romans 12, you know, our spiritual act of worship um, is to is our life. Um, our life is worship. Our, I think of Luther's talking about the milkman, um, how sacred uh, that position was, or the janitor, how sacred that position was. Um, if, they, if they don't do it, the, whole, the household dies. And it's, it's just, a, it's just a, a sacred, anything you do unto him is sacred. And so, yes, singing is such a blessing. Colossians 3.16 has really helped frame that, that for us. Um, it says, may the word of Christ dwell richly in you as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs for gratefulness to God in your heart. Um, and so singing, and I left out, the, oh, there's a couple more words in there, but but there's a, there's a pathway to the word of Christ dwelling richly. And so it's in which we see and, and we talk about, it's like we, we have these experiences in worship. And, and when we sing together, whether that's in our minivan, our car, or our kitchen, or a cubicle, or in a service, that man, something's happening to me. And we say things out loud, like maybe the atmosphere is changing or or the, or the spirit is doing. And I think the best way in a New Testament sense to wrap words around that is when we sing, the word of Christ dwells richly in you. And so you're going, well, you've heard God loves you your whole life, but you're just like, he loves me. And it, all of a sudden, it's just dwelling richly. You knew it. It's it's different. You, you you know it went from your heart to your head to your heart, and all the things. And God's using singing to do that, and so, which is so sacred and so special, that we get to be a part of um, delivering God's word and song in a way that, in places all over the world, God's word is dwelling richly in people, and that's affecting the rest of their day and the rest of their week and the rest of their year, not because of us, but because of his word and his spirit moving through that. So uh, I think we've seen, to, to summarize, I think we've seen the, how sacred singing is, but we've also, because we sing for a living, we've seen how sacred evening tuck-ins are and drives to school and my neighbor Mike coming over with his dog who doesn't know the Lord. and. We've just seen we've seen just the the sacredness of a life laid down at the Lord's altar, and I just a life lived for Him is is a is our act of worship. It's our sacred act of worshiping Him. I think you know. I mean, we we we're. I'll say this to your question: How do you distinguish the difference between the business of what we do versus the ministry of what we do, you know? And I think we're, we feel called to serve the body, you know? And so we're in the service industry. But I think that there's too much of a distinction between the different types of service to the body, you know? And, and I think we live in a specific, um, a specific industry that is, unique in in the sense of the platform the world would say that we're we're different or we might even think in our christian music industry or in the pastoral ministry or in the entertainment industry or as a ceo somebody who sits in a place and talks to people with like some kind of authority it's just like whatever that role is and that position of authority, when you're on a stage, it's a little bit higher or you're in a desk in, in the corner office, you know, 
We're called to serve people. And so with, with how we disciple people, with what we do when we go on the road, with like Shane's loving on his neighbor, with the dog that doesn't know the Lord, it's just like, man, we are called to serve people. We are called to serve God's people. Like, um, I, I tell a story, like there's nothing as a dad that's more incredible than someone, um, not me or my wife, taking interest in my kids. When they see something in my kid and they encourage my kid, especially when they encourage my kid in the Lord. And my kids, my kids, like their faith is built up. That's somebody outside of my sphere or in our sphere that loves my child, like unprompted. Like there's something in a father's heart that is like, man, that was awesome. Man, thanks for building my kid up. Man, God, I love that. And you talk to your wife about it at night and you're like, man, you know, when they said that to, to Olive, man, that was super helpful because she heard it in a way that I could, I didn't, you know, like that's, that's a, a provision of the Holy Spirit. You know, how much more does the Father in heaven love that? And with what we do, man, like, I mean, it, it does take resource to do those things, you know, whether it's your, you know, you're feeding somebody a, you know, a piece of chicken or whatever it is in the, ser- when we're in the service industry, you know, we do, we sell our wares, but ultimately, like the bottom line is, man, are we there? Are we serving God's people? And so we want to feed the body of Christ, the very richest of foods, and serve them with every, with all that we have, because man, these are God's kids. We're serving God's kids with the songs we write, with the places we go, with how we respond to adversity at a venue or a sound guy who's not the nicest, or you're in a line at you know, Chick-fil-A, you know, it's just like, man, we're all called. We, we need to stop thinking that this is, these are the ministers and the people. No, man, we're all the same. So whether you are working in a cubicle at a bank or at a restaurant, man, man, you're a minister. You're a minister. You're a minister first, you know. I mean, it's impo- almost impossible to believe a lot of times because we are we want to accurately handle the word of God and the things we write and say and sing and and whether it's our businesses or whatever it is, but like ultimately you know, we're in the we're in the service industry. We're in the service industry of the king. It's always fun to talk to ministry leaders about team building. So we asked, how are you growing unity within your organization? And that's a work in progress. I would say we're doing a horrible job of that. Yeah. <laughs> So if you have any, if you have any, actually, if you could just take some time to tell us how to build unity right now. We're in the, we're in the process of transitioning some people, you know, and it's, it's, it's interesting. I mean, because I think, you know, Shane and I, if you have a business or you're running an organization and you've had your hands to the plow for a really long time, and then you like somebody else steps in to that plow position, you know, and, um, it's, it's, it's tough when you're kind of been away from the field for a minute and you come back and you're like, what have you been doing? Yeah. (laughs) I I, I think if there's something, if I, if I can look back over the years, um, if I can look back over the years and see like, was there something we did that, that really fostered unity, um, to Shane's earlier point, um, you know, serving yeah. is, is showing up, serving, um, considering them better than ourselves. Yeah. Um, by God's grace. I mean, there's been lots of moments where that didn't happen, but, um, yeah, serving our team would be by far, I think if I look back going, that's the best way to create unity. Then Shane wanted to share about a very special song that God laid on them for the larger worshiping community. We have a song that God's been using in a way that uh, seems special. Uh, it happened last year in the, in the context of a lot of trouble, um, namely like a Syrian war and cancer. It was like 
uh, Ukrainian war. Yeah, not the Assyrian war. Assyrian wars thousands of years ago. There have actually been a few different <laughs> Assyrian wars. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, I didn't mean just like the right. Assyrians are at war yeah, I've, still? I've, 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 <laughs> I've done that a few times. <laughs> Ukrainian. Those doggone Babylonians. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they right, just are crazy right now. <laughs> oh, tank Philistine. <laughs> I thought you meant Putin. Right. <laughs> oh, Putin, right. Putin, Putin thing, different, same different thing. guy. Same, same thing. thing. And a buddy of mine sent me a, a chorus, and there was a line in there that said, To the Lord, I don't know what you're doing, but I know what you've done. I'm fighting a battle you've already won. And that just sent me into a stairwell, a singing. Um, to get around uh, this piece that we have in the finished work of Christ. And and then it kind of took me into this moment of not only do we know what he's done, and that's enough for us to step into tomorrow. We're good. He's enough. But because of his precious word, we know how this thing ends. We know how the story ends. And just wrapping some words around the finished work of Christ, how the story ends, and the fact that if you are his kid, if you received the love of God through his son, Jesus Christ, then your future is super bright, super bright. And uh, and that's just been a helpful reality in the midst of a lot of trouble, like just as we travel and sing to, to remind folks of what he's done, what he's going to do, a picture and a snapshot of what that's going to look like, out of the book of Revelation, and let's sing it together. So it's called You've Already Won, um, and it's been really, really special. In this last section, we covered the worship initiative and their hearts to help worship leaders in the church. We spend our days, all of our days, to try to encourage worship leaders and the church. That's what we do. That's what we do. We, we... In the form of a website. Yeah called the worship initiative so uh, d 10 years ago shane and i stepped out of a lot of travel we still do a little bit but we did a lot um to hunker down with a group of god sent people and create resources for worship leaders and it's called the worship initiative.com and we have a team a growing team and we just we talk about and hear from worship leaders. How can we serve you on the front lines? How can we help you um, see and love and know Jesus? How can we love, help you help your people see and love and know and worship Jesus? Um, and then we create resources. Um, so that's what, that's what we do. We feel like that's probably what we'll, we will always will do is just be a part of, of serving folks and from the practical side of this is just man we if we we just need this you know we just need, we don't have a keyboard player I mean, just, from just the nuts and bolts of what it takes to like pull off a sunday morning at a church startup you know to what it would take to disciple your band and what it would take to live a life of ministry and love your wife and just all the things that over the years god can we leverage the things that you've done for us into the body and um, because they're leading people in song. And like, if you ask old people like Wesley and Luther and Spurgeon, they're gonna say, man, if, you, if I got preaching and singing, I'm taking singing all day long. So if, you, if I'm gonna take one out of our recipe when we gather, I'm gonna take preaching out and we're gonna sing. And that's why they wrote so many songs. Cause they're like, our people aren't, are, their, their view of God isn't changing with necessarily with what we say they forget it that's when they walk out it's changing by what we sing and so we just want to just serve up the body in the form of worship leaders as they come before people and um and sing to him because there's such a huge opportunity i mean ultimately we want to see god bring his son back and when that happens every tongue and tribe on the whole entire planet, on some level, is going to worship him. Missions exist because worship doesn't, to quote John Piper. Missions exist because worship doesn't. And so the trickle-down effect of equipping pastors in the word 
to sing songs about Jesus with their people and the word of Christ dwelling richly in all those folks, in all their homes, is in our little corner is what we want to do. Um, and so the worship, the worship initiative has been a huge blessing, huge blessing. Thank you to Shane and Shane for spending time with us and sharing some of your story. If you haven't done so already, it would really mean a lot to us if you would subscribe to our podcast and leave us a review. We've got some interesting episodes coming up this year and some new formats that you're not going to want to miss. All right, until next time, I want to thank the team at Life Audio for their partnership. If you go to lifeaudio.com, you'll find a collection of Faith Center podcasts about health and wellness, parenting, current cultural events, Bible teachings, and more. So check them out at lifeaudio.com. I'm Joshua Swanson. Thanks for listening. Life Audio.